All right, hey everyone, my name is Nelson. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, and I've been living in Berlin for the past year. Um, I'm dedicating this talk in memory of my grandfather who passed away last week. So just a reminder to keep in touch with your loved ones. So if there's anything, if you don't understand anything I say today, just remember that. Uh, anyways, uh, I've been doing Kotlin for about two years now. I started uh, with Kotlin at my previous company that I worked at, Square. Right now, well, right now I work at Zenjob, uh, and our current code base is about 50% Kotlin, and we have about 20 modules in our code, just so you get a feel for our app size uh, when I discuss numbers and things like that. Okay. So, Couple questions. How many people here use Kotlin in their app? Everybody, pretty much? Okay. How many of you write build.gradle files? Okay, about half of you. And then how many people here have written a Kotlin build.gradle file? So build.gradle.kts. There's a couple people in the audience. Cool. I'm curious what your experience is too. So anyways, um, in this talk, we're gonna cover pros and cons of migration, some examples, and then we're also gonna talk about how the Kotlin DSL works under the hood. The current version of the Gradle Kotlin DSL is version 0 0.17.5. Uh, DSL means domain-specific language. Uh, there were some other talks on DSL this week. Uh, I won't talk too much about what a DSL is, uh, just how it's used in practice. Uh, but this version number it starts with a zero, and that's because it's still in a pre-release state. Uh, it's, well, we use it in production, it's stable, but the APIs may change. Um, so let's talk about some advantages of using Kotlin. Kotlin is a type safe language, so what that means is that you get all the advantages of type safety in your build scripts. And so what that means is that you get better IntelliJ autocompletion as well as type hints in your lambdas, uh, as you can see from this nice IntelliJ screenshot. What that also means is that if you have conditional statements in your build logic that are only executed under certain conditions, such as an if is CI block, um, that in Groovy, um, if you do something that doesn't work at all, it will not fail until you run it on CI. But in Kotlin, um, you will at least get type checking and make sure that the variables you're calling actually exist uh, when you compile the script. Autocomplete also looks way nicer. Um, it looks like you, what you would expect autocomplete to look like. Uh, one disadvantage to using Kotlin in your build scripts is that you're gonna have slower builds, uh, but it's only in certain conditions. So only if, you, if it's the first time you're compiling that script or if you're recompiling your build source. Uh, so what is a build source? I got this question last time. Um, build source is basically just sources for your build scripts. You put it in the build source directory, it's like any other Gradle module, except the code in there goes into your build scripts. So if you use this in your project, anytime you make a change to this, you'll have to recompile all your Kotlin build scripts. This is actually the same, you'll also have to recompile all your Groovy build scripts. Um, but in Kotlin it's a little bit slower. and so. The last time I, I gave this talk, we had 19 modules, and our build scripts took 18 seconds to compile, almost 18 seconds, according to our build scans. Um, but I'm very happy to report that the uh, Kotlin team, uh, the Gradle team, has been working on performance, and now we have 23 modules, and it takes 11 and a half seconds to compile our build scripts. Um, but just to emphasize, this is a one-time cost anytime you modify your build source. This is not an additional 20 seconds on 
every single build you do. Um, and the reason that this is such a high cost is that the build scripts do not compile in parallel. Um, I was talking to Stefan, who gave a talk earlier this morning on build performance, and he assures me that the Gradle team is working on this. Um, I also filed a bug for this, because when I was looking at this, um, I would expect that all the build scripts would compile in parallel. There's some technical reasons why this isn't possible right now, but uh, it will happen in the future. Um, there's also some other issues on the performance impacts of using the Kotlin, using Kotlin in your build scripts. Um, but once again, it's mostly just a first use cost or any time you uh, recompile your build sources. Uh, another disadvantage we ran into was um, there's less documentation on the Kotlin DSL than there is for the Groovy DSL. Now, this is improving a lot. Um, so, for example, now in certain parts of the Gradle documentation, you'll see examples for how to do the same thing in both Kotlin and Groovy. And uh, Stefan assures me that the goal is to have every single sample in both Kotlin and Groovy at some point. Um, another disadvantage we saw is that you have to dig into the source uh, sometimes and figure out how stuff works under the hood in order to implement it properly in Kotlin. Um, and so this just you know means clicking through and having fun. I like examining sources, but some people don't. So that's just, um, at least the way it is now, since there aren't examples for everything, you have to um, dig into the source. Uh, you also see some red lines in your IDE. Um, this has been getting a lot better with every version, but sometimes even though like everything on this slide is perfectly valid Kotlin DSL, uh, it doesn't, or it just shows up red in the IDE. Uh, and then you just sync your project again, and it's all better. Uh, some of the things, there's some missing features. Sometimes you won't be able to do the exact same thing you would be able to do with the Gradle DSL, uh, with the Kotlin DSL. Um, some examples of that are um, if you have imports at the top of your file, uh, and you, you can't use those inside the build script block. This is just one example um, that we ran into. So, um, and as well as extension functions don't work inside the build script block. Um, yeah, so the, here's just like a very simple pros and cons list I made. Um, it, just because the cons list is longer doesn't necessarily mean it's not worth it. Um, but uh, it's kind of something that I think everyone should decide for themselves. And it's very easy to try out. You can just migrate one file, and if you like it, and the performance, and if it's worth it, then you should, then you should do it. Um, so, the next part of the talk, I'm going to focus on um, migrations. Uh, so these are specific examples, and how, how to do the migration. Um, and so really what that is is just adding a little .kts at the end of all your build files. That's the easy part. <laughs> um, so actually the first thing I'm going to go through is the settings.gradle.kts. This is probably the easiest file to migrate because usually you don't have much stuff in it. Uh, so it's usually just a list of all the modules you have in your project. So for example, if you have these three modules, um, the way you migrate it to Groovy is just like this. Um, instead of having each line individually, you can just pass it to this function called include the name of each one of your modules. So that's one example. Now, before I continue down this talk, we're going to talk a lot about Kotlin extension functions and Kotlin extension properties. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify what they are. Otherwise, um, you might be totally lost in the next couple slides. 
So Kotlin provides the ability to extend a class with new functionality without having to inherit from that class. That's what an extension function is, and that's what an extension property is. So a very simple uh, example of what an extension function is, and I just stole this from the Kotlin examples, is if you wanted to add a swap method to a list, you declare the object that you want to add the functionality to, such as mutable list, and then you add a dot operator, and then the name of your method. And so within this scope, for every mutable list that you have, you have this new additional method swap that you can call, and it's basically as if it were an additional method on the mutable list object. Extension properties work almost exactly the same way. The syntax is a little different. So let's say if I wanted to add a property called last index to the list object, um, it looks exactly like this. And the uh, get syntax denotes that it's a property and not a function. Okay. So next let's take a look at a build.gradle.kts file. And First, we're going to do this part by part, and the first thing we're going to look at is the plugins block. So let's say we have a super simple build.gradle uh, build file that looks like this. Um, and obviously this isn't a real uh, build.gradle file because it wouldn't make sense to apply the Java library plugin, the Kotlin plugin, and the Android library plugin to the same um, build script, but this is just to show you how to use different plugins and how to apply them. So um, what this would look like in the Kotlin DSL is just like this. Um, it almost looks like the groovy version, but there's some interesting syntactical differences that I'll dive into in a bit. Um, but just to show you what the whole Kotlin file will look like. Uh, in the Kotlin DSL is like this. So it looks pretty similar to the Groovy version. And now I'll break down why um, you have this plugins block. So let's take a look at just the outside part, the plugins block. Um, what this is, is it's a function and it's a lambda with a receiver. And what that, well, I don't want to spend the talk talking about lambdas with receivers because I think I'll lose some people, but uh, it just allows you to pass that, like, those curly brackets, and that's the most simple way of explaining it. So the curly brackets, that just means that plugins is a lambda with receiver. Um, and what that does is it configures all the plugin dependencies for that project. And um, what the, the receiver is a plugin dependencies spec scope. And if you look at the documentation, it says the sole purpose of this class is to hide all the members provided by the outer uh, Kotlin build script. Uh, so it just makes it, it's just a wrapper, basically, around the plugin dependencies spec. And what is the plugin dependencies spec? Well, um, it basically looks exactly like that plugins block that we had in our build script, it has this one, only one function, which is ID, and you pass it a string. Uh, and if you look at the documentation there, the documentation example here is actually in Groovy, and it looks almost exactly like what we had in the Kotlin version. Uh, the Gradle team is actually moving to make the syntaxes between the Groovy version and the Kotlin version to be more similar. There's also an incubating annotation at the top, uh, but there's a lot of kind of extraneous incubating annotations um, throughout the Gradle code, but um, this is definitely not an incubating uh, part of the plugin, or part of Gradle. So anyways, if we go back to this plugins block, you can see for the Android, com to Android library plugin, we're using that ID ID function, but there's also other functions we're calling here, so how are those working? Um, so if we take a look at this Kotlin, that's actually a function, and um, it's just an extension function. Uh, and if we want to 
see how this function is actually created under the hood. Uh, it's just created using very simple code generation. And um, this code generation is just a simple string. And, but the question is why would we do code generation if we, look, we know exactly what it's going to look like every time this is just a string. Uh, the reason is, well, as developers, we're lazy and good developers are lazy. And it'd be really annoying to update the version number every time you make a release. So this code generation just allows the um, version number to be updated in the documentation every time. And this is just simply created with uh, a Gradle task. So there's one last part to this plugins block, and that's the Java library. Uh, and that is also an extension property, which calls the ID method. So all these different parts of this plugins block are just different extension functions under the hood. And you could just simply call the ID function, but what the Gradle team is doing is trying to make it as easy as possible to use the um, Kotlin plugin by creating all these extension functions for you. And the way this specific extension function is created is it looks at all the Gradle jars that are part of your Gradle installation and creates plugins, um, plugins for all of them. All right, so I know that code generation makes a lot of people sleepy, so uh, let's get back to talking about the dependencies block. So let's say you have a dependencies block in Groovy. Um, the way you would migrate that over to uh, Colin is simply like this. And you can see that it looks almost exactly like the Groovy syntax with just changes in the quotes and parentheses. And here's again what it looks like in your full build.gradle file. Um, but yeah, just here's again the Gradle version and the Kotlin version. So there aren't too many syntactical differences uh, between the two. You just have to know where to put your parentheses and where to put your quotes. Uh, next, we're going to look at a common pattern that a lot of people have in their, uh, in their Gradle files, which is using an ext block to define dependencies across the project. So let's say, for example, you have an ext block that defines your dependencies so that you don't have to redefine your dependencies in all your build.gradle files. So in Groovy, you, uh, you create this depths, and depths is a map of strings to either strings or maps of strings. Uh, in this case, we're going to start by just looking at the case where it's a string to a string. Uh, a fun thing to note about Groovy is that everything in Groovy is either a map or a string. You can just call the dot operator on pretty much any object, and it's either a map or a string. And that cr when you're migrating over to making it type safe in Kotlin, that kind of poses a problem because things can either be strings or maps, and you don't know which one. So you kind of have to tell Kotlin. So if you have a if you start using the depths block like this in your Gradle file, and let's just focus on the depths.junit part, um, the way you would migrate that over to the Kotlin syntax would be like this. And once again, it looks almost exactly like the Groovy syntax. Above is the Groovy syntax, below is the Kotlin syntax. But actually, I had to add, I had to create my own um, extension function in order to make the syntax uh, be similar. So this is just an extension function we created, and it returns any. And the reason it returns any is because calling this could either return a string or a map. So uh, when you call it, you don't know. <laughs> so you could also, there are many ways of doing this. You could also create two extension functions, one that returns a string and one re that returns a map. But this is basically how you access this groovy uh, dependencies block. Uh, 
or one way of doing it. And then if you have, if you want to access that map, um, within the map, then it starts to look a little ugly like this. Or another way to do it would be to create another extension function that would do this for you. So this is what our build at Gradle file looks like now, now that we're using the dependencies block. And again, this is what it looks like in Groovy, just for a comparison. All right, so next, we're gonna take a look at what the one last part was the source compatibility part. It looks almost the same, except you have to add this little Java block on the outside. The reason for this is that the, this Java block is actually applied as a convention, which gets mixed into the project. Um, in Groovy, you can have sort of mix-ins that add functionality to objects. This is not something that you can do in Kotlin, so you just have to add it as part of this um, Java block. And this Java block is, once again, an extension function with a lambda with a receiver, and uh, it just allows you to access this um, convention that is mixed into the object in Groovy. And so yeah, once again, this is what our Kotlin file looks like. So at this point, I'm seeing a lot of confused faces. Um, the next part of the talk is gonna dive into a little bit more of the uh, uh, code generation parts of the Kotlin DSL. But before we get started on that, I had one question. Who thinks Google should bring back the blob emojis? Got some hands up, all right. I just needed to break up the talk because otherwise I think, I think it's a lot of code and lots of slides. So anyways, um, another way to, if you are adding properties to the extension block in Kotlin, um, it turns out there's like multiple extensions on the extension block. So uh, there's different ways of accessing them and different ways of creating them. So there's now an extension function that's part of the Kotlin DSL that lets you very easily do what you would do like this in Groovy. You can do it like this in Kotlin and there's no additional custom written extension function. It's just the extension function that provi that's provided to you as part of the DSL. However, if you want to, in Groovy, one thing you can do is you can just call is CI anywhere in your build script like this. And if you want to be able to do that in Kotlin and it's, you know, make it look ex exactly, exactly the same, then you need to create your own little extension function for that one property. Okay, so now we're gonna take a second look at the Java compatibility block and how that works under the hood. So this was this Java source compatibility thing I was talking about earlier, um, which looks like this in Kotlin. What these actually are are setters and getters, just traditional Java setters and getters. Java setters and getters turn into properties in Kotlin, so that's why you can use the nice uh, property access syntax like this. Um, and that Java plugin convention I was talking to you, that's mixed into the project dynamically, the way it happens is in this apply function, which applies the Java base plugin to your project, also applies this Java plugin convention. And that, that, this is the code that I, from Gradle that actually mixes in that Java convention into your project in Groovy. Uh, and then that Java um, extension function is created in this file called accessors.kt, which is where the Kotlin DSL provides accessors for pretty much every little bit of functionality that you'd want. Um, and so basically what that means is that instead of doing any of the other ways of accessing this convention, you have this really nice syntax at the, the top. Um, the bottom three ways are just other ways of doing exactly the same thing in Kotlin. Um, 
but the extension function also does exactly the same thing and gets you the nice syntax at the top. And oh, this is just the the function at the bottom. These the functions were added in the um, 0 0.17 version of the DSL plugin. Uh, and they basically allow you to easily find any convention anywhere in your build script. OK, seeing some sleepy faces. So I threw in another emoji. <laughs> um, OK. So how is this, how, how are these conventions actually generated under the hood? There's this huge accessors.kt file in the Kotlin DSL, but how does it find all these accessors? How does it find all these conventions? Um, the way it works is it takes a look at all the plugins you apply to any of your projects, and then it starts writing this file. And then for every accessor in the file, and that's the lines you see at the bottom, it appends a line, or it, it creates a, a string, and what that string is is the accessors, and adds it to this file. And so now we're going to take a look at this for each accessor method. What that does is it takes a look at every extension, every convention, and every configuration in your project, and it generates a nice accessor for it. And I know this sounds really confusing. I would like to take a look at how things work. But um, you won't need to take a look at how things work because the Kotlin team, or sorry, the Gradle team has done a lot of the work for you uh, by creating these accessors. And as of the 0 0.17 version of the Kotlin DSL, there's pretty much an accessor for everything. All right, so one last pro tip on migrating from the Kotlin DSL to the Gradle DSL is using named parameters. Groovy has a notion of named parameters. And so does Kotlin. But the thing is, you can't pass a named parameter from Kotlin to Groovy. So this is the syntax that Groovy uses to pass named parameters to functions. And like I was saying earlier, everything in Kotlin is either a string or a map. And the same goes for named parameters. They're actually just a map. So it's pretty easy to migrate over. You just change it to a map. So the name of each parameter is the key in the map, and the value you're passing is the value you're passing. And so if we go back to this block, um, by the way, oh, I forgot to explain. This is a common configuration block. I just copied this from the Lee Canary documentation. What it does is it ensures that you don't use a real version of Lee Canary in any of your JVM unit tests. Um, and so the way you migrate that over from Groovy to Kotlin is it's almost exactly the same. And in this case, actually, the Kotlin syntax is a little bit easier because you don't have to uh, reference the object that you're inside of. Uh, so if we just flip back, um, in the Groovy version, you had to call config.name.contains. In the Kotlin version, you just call name.contains. Uh, so in this case, the syntax is a little nicer, except for the named parameters part. Cool. So that concludes the um, confusing part of my talk. Um, so in the end, experimenting with stuff is fun. Uh, I will, and moving over to the Kotlin DSL uh, will definitely slow down your build speeds in certain cases. The Kotlin DSL is definitely still in not hasn't reached the 1.0 version, but improvements are happening all the time, and lots of new improvements are on the horizon. Um, and also, you've learned today that everything is an extension function, and everything is a string in Groovy, or a map. So the question I get is, would I recommend it? It really depends on the size of your project and whether you're using build source. If your project is really small and you're not using build source, I would definitely uh, recommend just migrating one file and trying it out. Um, for bigger projects, once again, you migrate one file and try it out and see the impact it has on your project. Um, so now I'd like to open the floor for questions. I know the, that Germany is starting to play really, really soon, and a lot of people want to see that. Um, if you 
are curious about how to migrate your Gradle tasks to Kotlin, I also have some more slides on that. But for now, I'll open the door to questions. And thank you, guys. Question over there? Uh, for questions, oh. we have two microphones over oh. here. We have 10 minutes for questions. Cool. Hi. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. I have a question regarding the uh, dependencies, scopes, like the configurations of Gradle. Yeah. Uh, you shown us that there are com configurations like implementations, test implementations. What about the configurations which are created dynamically by the build types, for instance? I have an in a dependency in only in the debug, right? The debug, implement debug implementation, the release implementation. Is it supported by the Kotlin DSL or not? Yeah. So there are actually extension functions for debug implementation and release implementation. But if you're creating um, yeah, my own, my own build types. Yeah, if you're creating mm -hmm. your own build types, they'll also get uh, an extension function. But if you're dynamically including or deleting those, then you might not have the extension function uh, callable. So what you can do in that case is um, each configuration is actually just, uh, it's a string, like it has a name, named string. And so if you, just look at the source for, for example, debug implementation. You'll see that it just calls um, create with the string debug implementation. So you can create your own extension function that looks exactly the same. And then you'll get pretty much exactly the same syntax. Okay, um, but I have to do that manually, right? It, it doesn't just generate or something. Yeah. Okay. It'll, it'll, gen on, it'll generate it for you unless you're dynamically removing and adding uh, build types at runtime. So if you, for example, um, let's say you, you have like an extra variant that you only publish from CI, and you have like on CI add this extra variant, and then okay. you have specific dependencies, that's the only case. Otherwise, that variant will get its own little nice extension function. OK, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys.